Title, Setting the Table for a Study on Fear. Setting the Table for a Study on Fear. Brother Bruce. This is not a robbery. This is. <laughs> You're all set, Tim? We good? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brother Dennis. Well, it's certainly good to see your, at least your smiling eyes, if not your smiling faces. <laughs> As Brother Dennis said, it's been a long time. It seems, uh, you know, Sherry and I get a, try to get away for a week each winter, and it seems like it's a month when we miss a Sunday and a Tuesday back in the same week. And this is, uh, this has been a haul. But we praise God. God is good. God is good. Well, as we uh, begin our considerations of a topic as large as fear, from our biblical perspective, it's important to understand that fear is a very normal, natural reaction and practically unavoidable. Of course, I'm not a doctor, nor have I played one on TV. But I'd like to, for us to start our considerations, I'm not going to tell you, don't be afraid. Okay? I mean, that's what we always do. Tell the kid, don't be afraid, like, like that's supposed to send it away. Or that you have nothing to fear. I'm certainly not going to tell you, you have no faith if you fear. I'm not going to tell you, be like me, I don't fear anything. I know Jesus. Those aren't helpful. Those aren't helpful. But we will look at some things in the next uh, couple of weeks that, that should be helpful to us. I want to share with you a few things I took from a Psychology Today article entitled The Five Only Fears We All Share, which addresses a few natural facts about fear. The author's main point is, is he's, he's trying to show that all of our fears fall, fall into five categories, which don't do anything for us in our study. But he does define fear. And he defines fear as an anxious feeling caused by our anticipation of some imagined event or experience. An anxious feeling caused by an anticipation of some imagined event or experience. We don't know what's around the corner next in our lives. We make our plans. We have assumptions. I had a talk for March 20th or whatever we thought we were going to be. All long gone. And our life experiences have taught us that the nice, well things that we optimists are all expecting to come do not always come true. And then we, there are many, many things that we have no control over in our lives. And if you're one of the poor pessimists, they don't know the future either, but they know it's going to be bad. They just don't know how bad it's going to be. They often feel that they have no control over anything in their lives. There is almost no limit to the imagination of man. And fear, that anxious feeling, is caused by what we anticipate might or could happen. The article points out that fear is, a, as he puts it, a standardized biological reaction. It is a normal thing that all of us have, and there should be no shame or guilt 
or even surprise that our initial reaction to bad news is a spark of fear. It's a natural physical reaction that just happens. The author says that like other emotions, fear is basically information. To which I would say, this is where Satan, as the ruler of the air and of this present age, has a natural advantage over the use of our standard biological reactions. As Christians, we can expect Satan to fan those sparks of fear with exaggerated anticipation of how bad things might become. Let me give you the whole quote. The author is speaking of fear. He says, like other emotions, it's basically information. It offers us knowledge and understanding if we choose to accept it. It offers us knowledge and understanding if we choose to accept it. Fear is good. It's a necessary warning mechanism that we use routinely every day. Being well and of a sound mind, fear alerts us to situations. Then we typically assess whether we accept or reject that information. And this is where we're going to focus our learning to combat not fear itself, but the debilitating effects of fear that often causes us to not think clearly, keeps us from doing the best things that we would do if we were thinking clearly. We live and we have been trained in the world's ways and the world's standards. And thus, these are what come naturally to us. If we choose to accept it, is the key to taking some control over the effect of our fear and in dictating to us what kind of lives we're going to live. Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are not to remain in conformity to the thinking and ways of the world. Understand that our beginning point and our default position for you computer people, that that we naturally automatically go back to are the ways of this world. Therefore, Paul says forcefully that we are to be transformed. Okay, this is, this is not just a little trimming around the edges or slight adjustments to the way we look and see the world now. This is rejecting and discarding the old ways and be totally transformed. Transformed from a sinner, an enemy of God, and slave to sin, to a child of God by renewing our minds and the way we think. Most of our feelings and emotions, including fear, are learned. Information we have either received or rejected over our lifetime from the world. Your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. That is why I say repeatedly, don't let your feelings slap you around. Revert back to what you know and what we know from God's word. God's truth. This is what we know. Thy word is truth. Let me give you an example. What my whistle here. You know, there are times of trouble when I can just feel the presence of the Lord and I feel it mightily. And I know that he is with me all the way through that trouble. I know it because I can feel it. And it's a great feeling. It's a powerful feeling. 
calm, confident, assuring feeling, peaceful. Even when I know I'm in trouble, when I feel the Lord right next to me, I don't fear anything. Then, oftentimes, when in trouble, I don't feel his presence at all. I feel like I'm alone, and I wonder, where are you, Lord? Are you there? Do you know what's going on? not the same feeling. This fear, anxious about what's to come. Sometimes it's almost a panic feeling. My feelings are telling me that I have been left alone. And you know, Satan has whispered in my ear, he's left you, you know, you're all alone. When you needed him most, he's not there. You know he's not there. You can feel it. Do you feel it? He's not there. He's gone. He bailed on you, Bruce. Right when you needed him. And you know it because you can't feel it. He's not there. But what do I know? I know what I feel, okay? but what do I know? For this talk, I googled, I will never leave you. And the first thing that popped up was an article titled, 100 verses about, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I knew practically all of them. As I started to read, after the first couple words, my memory was jogged, and my memory needs lots of jogging these days. But my memory was jogged, and I could, I could remember. I could finish them almost all. Hundred verses. That's what I know. Not what I feel, that's what I know. And that's what I must allow my life to be dictated by. For who will I believe? What information will I accept and what will I reject? My feelings are clear, no doubt about that. I don't feel him anywhere, and yet I know. I know the promise of God and what our Lord Jesus said. I am with you to the end of the age. I will never leave you. Or forsake you. I have a choice. I can accept my feelings and listen to the same one who told Eve that she will surely not die, or I can take the word of God and on that authority reject how I feel, reject the fear information. I can go confidently knowing that he is right here. Not because I feel him, because he says so. He knows exactly what I'm going through. And even more, he knows why he's allowing me to go through this test. Oh, he's here. It has a purpose and often it has to do with building faith, which we will consider in subsequent sessions. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with the poem, Footprints in the Sand, where a sister has a dream, and she and the Lord are walking and talking as they stroll along the beach. And she looks back and sees the footprints in the sand, and she notices that down on the sand, she observes all the major events of her life. And she knows that there are two sets of footprints, her own and those of the Lord. 
side by side throughout her life. And she notices at certain times there's only one set of prints, one set of footprints. And then most disturbingly, she notices that it's at the lowest and hardest times of her life. There's only one set of prints. So what do her feelings and world experiences tell her? I now quote from the poem. I don't understand. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never ever during your trials and testings. And you saw only one set of footprints. It was then that I carried you. By the renewing of our minds, we need to learn everything new. Not from the world's perspective and limitations, but from God's. By understanding that this is not just another book, it's not another man-made philosophy. This is the Word of God the Almighty. He who knows the end from the beginning. He who cannot lie, nor can he fail to fulfill all his promises and purposes. You never have to wonder, is this true? Is that right? You need only to wonder if you understand it correctly. For the writer of the poem, even though she knew that the Lord said he would never leave her, she doubted when she was confronted with what she thought was the proof. And there was only one conclusion in her eyes and her experiences. But why would the Lord leave her at her toughest times? Why would she think that her Lord left her when the going was toughest? I'll tell you why. Why I think. Because that's what the world does. That's what the world teaches us. We have lots of friends when things are going well to share our good times. But where is everybody when we hit the hard times? That's when we learn who our friends are. What a friend we have in Jesus. Unbeknownst to her, there was another possible explanation. And that the promises of God are true no matter what we are seeing or feeling. Faith believes when we can't see how, but we know and we believe because God said so. Many times we're left to think that, well, God said so. That, that's kind of a weak reason. There's no better. There's no better reason to believe. The writer of Hebrews says that the father of the faithful, Abraham, was willing to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac because he knew that God had made promises that would come only through Isaac. So even if Abraham killed Isaac as God commanded, it says Abraham reasoned that God would have to bring him back. Did Abraham know of anybody God brought back from the dead? No. Did it matter? No. He, but he reasoned that God had to bring him back if he killed him to fulfill the promises that had yet to happen through Isaac. And because God cannot fail to keep his promises. 
He didn't know how God would do it, but that didn't matter. That was God's problem. With God, all things are possible. God is not relegated to how little we know and how little we see. Enough for point number one. Fear is normal and natural, thus there is no need to deny it, worry, or be ashamed of our initial fears. Point number two is that fear offers us information that we can either accept, retain, and, or we can reject. We have a measure of control over the effect of fear in our lives. The next piece of our setup for our study on fear is a fact which everybody knows, and as one governor recently stated rather indelicately, old people die. To which I add, old people die young. Even if they reach 100 years old, old people die young. And what scripture would I use for that? Well, I've got a few. You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Surely all mankind stands as mere breath. As flesh is, all flesh is like grass. All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Like a flower he comes forth and withers. He also flees like a shadow and does not remain. Thus he remembered that we were but flesh, a wind that passes and does not return. In one of David's prayers he says, For we are sojourners before you and tenants, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. Another verse, my days are like a lengthened shadow and I wither away like grass. Nearly everyone in here except maybe Mammy you understand what wither away like grass is, what it feels like. And you know what comes after a lengthened shadow. It's gone. And poor Joe states, <laughs> My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to end without hope. Rather than I've been reading these scriptures for 38 years, and yet still I sit and I scratch my head and wonder how I got to within months of totally exhausting my three score and ten years over. The writer of Hebrews declares, and it is appointed for men to die once, and after this the judgment. You know, many today seek equality of outcome. And they need only to be patient. For the great equalizer of all mankind is death. It doesn't matter whether you're a pharaoh or a slave, a man or a woman, from Hollywood or Harlem, honorable or a thief, in the end, we all live with our, we all leave with our equal share. Nothing. We came in with nothing, we leave with dust to dust. Death is among the surest facts of life, and as we heard from David and Job, it comes and it leaves no hope. Solomon writes that there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol in the grave. This is the reality for all mankind, from Adam and Eve until the second Adam returns and bring this dark night to an end. If fear is as the 
author of the article said, an anxious feeling caused by our anticipation of some imagined event or experience, then we can feel well justified if we're petrified of death because death is not an imagined event. It is sure and only a matter of when. Life for all of us on the sphere is going to cease. How's that for an uplifting message, brethren? I bet you're glad you worked your way in this morning. But we're not going to end on that note, brethren. We may or may not choose it. But we've inherited it. Because of sin, we have inherited death. The wages of sin is death, thus it is appointed for men to die once. Why do I say that a hundred years is short? <laughs> because I'm 70 and I know how fast that goes, especially the last 40 years. And I know how short a hundred years is. And more importantly, because God made man to live eternally. He intended us to live with a perfect body in a perfect, peaceful, harmonious environment where His will is done. Because of sin, the ground was cursed. Peace and harmony was gone. Communion with God was gone. As well as access to the tree of life. Mercifully, God shortened the life experiences for all under these dark conditions. Here the prophet Isaiah, as he speaks about a time, the millennial age that is to come, when God's kingdom is upon the earth, Jesus reigns with the church, and men learn righteousness. From Isaiah 65, 20. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. With Satan bound a thousand years, the minimum a child will live is a hundred years, a short time. And if they should live only a hundred years, it's because they have rejected the grace of God, unwilling to accept and comply with the will of God. Our stay in the land of darkness is allowed by God so as to enable us to appreciate the light. But God shortens that time in his mercies. Again from Isaiah, this time Isaiah 60, 1 to 3, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Is there any doubt as to who the great light the prophet is speaking of is? The Gospel of John 1, 4, 5, and then 9 through 13. In him, speaking of Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the, dark, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of flesh, of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus is the light of the world. And those whom God has called and chosen, whom he's given eyes that see and ears that hear in this age, Jesus and his glory has arisen over you. And you have, called, you have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light in this age. And his glory is seen upon you today. We have become the Israel of God. And I would suggest that when Isaiah says, the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising, that he is only that this is only partially fulfilled in this age and will not reach its complete fulfillment until the end of the millennial age. We read this in Revelation 21. When the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven, we read this from Revelation 21, 22 to 26. But I saw no temple in it, speaking of the new Jerusalem. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved, the redeemed, of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. I suggest that then the prophecy of Isaiah 63 will be fulfilled fully, and the light of Jesus Christ will be seen by all mankind. From Adam to the last child conceived, Jesus Christ is the hope of all ages. When King David and Job wrote of the brevity of life and there being no hope, the only promise David knew was of God's protection the physical promises of land to the nation of Israel. And God's promise to David that from his loins would come one who would sit on his throne forever. Although Job had restored unto him all that he had lost and all that was taken away, he had no knowledge of how God would do it. Yet still, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me, God has put eternity in the hearts of men. And you, my brethren, we have been given a great hope that they did not have, they did not know. Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 1, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and for generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. For this morning, setting the table for our study on fear, we need to keep these facts in mind. Fear is natural, an automatic alert, 
and our reaction is nothing to be ashamed of, denied, or suspicious of. Fear is information and can be accepted or rejected after our initial feelings. Three, we are continually trained and indoctrinated by the world around us, and thus our first initial thoughts and feelings are to be held with great suspicion and compared to what we know from God's Word. Lord willing, the next week, we will look more closely at why Christians have no need to fear death as the rest of humanity does. We don't live in denial of our short existence. We don't live with the thought that at death you just go to a different room. Death is dead. But we have the great hope of the resurrection. We don't live in denial of our very short existence and that unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, our end in this age is sure to be death. Just as God warned Adam would happen, and just like the other billions of sinners before us, we will join them in proving that the wages of sin is death. However, God has sent a Savior to enlighten the world, to release the captives, one who holds the keys of Hades, the grave, and death. Before the world began, God's plan of salvation for all creation was devised and has been revealed to his saints. Just like the rest of his word, God's plan of salvation for the world of mankind is sure. The good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the coming kingdom of God are lessons Christians can't hear nor be reminded of too often. To doubters and non-believers who may be listening, stick around. There's plenty of good news for all, man God, all mankind in God's plan. And we will pray that he removes the blindness that covers your eyes to the glorious truth of the gospel message. God's grace and love for all of his creation does not end with Christ's return. He takes his bride. God pours out his wrath on all sin, and then he brings this dark night to a close. Micah 7, 18 to 20 says, He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. He will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Jesus says in John 5.29, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. It's not my job to convince you of anything, as that is way above my pay grade. My job is to throw you to seed, to preach the gospel as a witness to you, and leave the accepting and believing to you and God. Let me end this morning with this joyous reminder for the children of God. Again, we read from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he, speaking of Jesus, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, listen now, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those 
who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We do not stay subject to the bondage of fear. Hallelujah. What a Savior. God, I need you. That was quite the table set. We look forward to your, your series here coming up. Thank you, Brother Bruce. Again, great to see you all here this morning. Uh, we're going to close with uh, 606. He leadeth me, O blessed God. And uh, I'll ask Brother Bruce to close in prayer.
but most of all, Father, that they might know your great love. Your love and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, again, we pray that your, Brother Dennis prayed that you put your hedge around each of us, Father, and that we can live not foolishly or recklessly, Father, but that we might live smartly and confidently, knowing that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, these things all we ask in the precious name and the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to your honor and glory. Amen.